السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمد و نستعین و نستغفر و نؤمن به و نتوکل علیہ و نعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا و من سیئیات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له و من يذلله فلا هادي له و نشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له و اشهد ان محمدا عبده و رسوله رب اشرح لي صدري و يسر لي امري و هل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي So ahlan wa sallam for the next uh, session of the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, as usual, let us have a recap on the previous session number 31. Uh, we spoke about Al-Nadir ibn al-Harith, who was considered to be the shaitan of the Quraysh. Uh, the main reason was he was a very sarcastic commentator of the Quran. And over eight ayahs in the Quran were revealed about him, about his attitude. Then we went to some of the captives who were not able to pay any ras ransom and so the Prophet ﷺ released them without paying ransom. And one person specific to mention is Abu Azza, who is a poet. He was released on the condition that he will never fight against the Muslims. He was so very pleased with the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ that when he went to Mecca, he wrote a poem praising the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, as we proceed in today's talk, you'll see the developments that took place. And then came the thing on the spoils of war where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly mentioned how the spoils of war were to be distributed. One-fifth of the spoils of war are for Allah and his messenger, and the remaining four-fifths is to be distributed amongst all those who participated in the war. Then one important we referred was Ghazwatu Sabih, that is uh, barley where Abu Sufyan and his party come near Madina, and in the night, they set fire to an orchard of date palms in Madina and kill the caretakers before they leave. And as they leave and escape back to Makkah, they keep behind many goods and some food also, which the Prophet ﷺ said the companions can take. Next, we spoke of the nikah of Ali Anhu with Fatima Anha the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, and the gifts that the Prophet ﷺ gave her at the time of marriage. And then about the Walima, and then when both of them started living their lives, we came to the Tasbih of Fatima Anha. And also we looked on how they spent their lives together, all the good deeds that they did, and because of their sacrifice, giving up their food for the, for the needy, Allah revealed an ayah for them. There are two ayahs which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed. Then we spoke of the expulsion of Banu Khainukha, the tricks that they played, the threat that they gave to the Prophet wasalam, and ultimately they got besieged within their own fort and they were forced to leave this uh, Medina, and they had to go to another, settle down in another place near Syria. And then, what were the benefits of expelling Banu Khainukha? We looked into this also. Now, let's go to the next slide, please. Now, while there were other smaller incidents of Ghazwa and Sarika, etc., etc., they were quite small, just try to imagine the number of events that took place for the Prophet ﷺ within a very small span of time from the time he entered Medina to what is taking place one after the other, one after the other. 
Now, the next major incident have happened in the third year of Hijra and can be called as the precursor for the Battle of Uhud. Now, how did all this take place? How did this start? It's interesting to know how all these incidents took place and ultimately came to the beginning of the Battle of Uhud. In the previous session, we had made a small mention of Kaab ibn al-Ashraf, who was very who was criticizing the Prophet ﷺ very much, every time. Now, he is considered as the instigator of the Battle of Uhud. Now, the incident that I'm going to mention now involved a particular, this particular man, Kaab ibn al-Ashraf. He lived outside of Medina. Now, let us look at his background. His father was an Arab from Banu Tai. He was therefore considered an Arab. Now, Kaab's mother, on the other hand, she belonged to the Jewish tribe of Banu Nadir. And as per the Jews, it is the name is established through the mother and not the father. So therefore, Kaab was ex uh, accepted as a Jew. So he was both an Arab and a Jew. And he was very well connected with both the Arabs and Jews. And he was someone who was held very high, of a very high rank in both the communities. And to add to all that, he was literate, he was talented, he was a well-known poet also. And on top of all that, he was a man of great status and luxury. Now, Kaab was very agitated when the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina and the Islam started spreading. And Medina was basically becoming a Muslim city. So what he did, he went to Makkah. After the Battle of Badr, he addressed the people of the Quraysh. He said, Wallahi, if Muhammad is able to defeat you people, then we are better off in the ground that is underground, dead, rather than on top of the ground. We should die fighting him. We can't stay like this. So what did he do? He launched a campaign in Makkah with the support of the Quraysh. And he conducted a fundraising campaign to encourage the Quraysh to donate for the fund, uh, war fund. Now, how did the Quraysh prepare for the Battle of Ohad. They had decided they are going to start a war. What they did was, from the profits made in their trade with people of other lands, the Quraysh demanded from their people to return the profits and investment that they had made in these caravans. Also recall the caravan of Abu Sufyan, which had reached uh, Makkah safe and sound he had all the wealth of these people, all that they had invested along with the prophets. He, they were all asked to return these things. And an entire year of planning went into this. Ibn Ishaq tells us that Abu Sufyan used to go and knock into every door of the Quraysh household and ask them to contribute to the Battle of Fahad by returning any profits that they had already made or giving some of their own contribution for the war. Now, Allah references this in the Quran. If you go to Surat Al Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah number 36, the interpretation reads Verily, those who disbelieve spend their wealth to hinder from the path of Allah. And so will they continue to spend it. But in the end, it will become an anguish for them. Then they will be overcome and those who disbelieve will be gathered into hell. So the Quraysh reached out to the major tribes like Kinana and Tihama and other tribes close by and asked them for money, asked them for people and asked them for armor and weapons, etc., whatever they could contribute. So with Ohad, what we find is 
Initially, the conflict was between the Quraysh and the Prophet And now the conflict has changed. The circle has become widened. And ultimately what has happened, it has become a conflict between Islam and paganism. It started in a small way, but became a very big issue. Now, I would like you to recall Abu Uzza, Abu Azza, he was released on condition that he does not fight against the Muslims. He was so pleased with it that he went back to Mecca and wrote a very nice poem praising the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ. But now look what happens. He betrays the Prophet ﷺ. When he went back to Mecca, some of the Quraysh visited him and they kept tempting him to join in the war. They said, if you fight with us and if you come back alive, then we will make you a very rich man. He fell for this temptation and accepted the offer. What role did he do? He became a key part of the army recruitment process. And to add to it, he started another poem or a number of poems calling the Quraysh saying that you are the children of honorable men. This is your year. This is your moment. I am not with Islam. I am with you. So let us proceed. Also, Jubair bin Mu'tim, he went to his slave, Wahshi. Uh, you may recall this and said, I want you to go with the army. And if you are able to kill Hamza, Ibn al -Muttalid, the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, in revenge for my uncle who was killed at Badr, then I will free you from the bonds of slavery. This was another offer. So ultimately with all these uh, efforts, the Quraysh were able to gather 3,000 men, 200 horses and 700 armors. So this time, you would recall for the Battle of Badr, they had taken some women along with them to entertain them. But in the case of the Battle of Uhad, they also took many of their wives with them, in, including the famous Hind bint Utba, the wife of Abu Sufya. And it is said that up to two dozen of the women of the Quraysh participated. And how did they contribute to this? They would sing their poetry, which was somewhat sensual in nature. They were encouraging the men to show their manhood and discouraging them from coming back empty-handed from the war. Now, Abu Sufyan was the main leader of the army. He took the right flank. He put Khalid ibn Walid in charge. On the left of him, he kept Ikrima, the son of Abu Jahl. The beautiful part of it is, you will find that later, all these three accepted Islam. Subhanallah. Now, let us go back to this fellow, Kaab ibn al-Ashra. Now, in Makkah, he was playing the mischief there. In Madina, what he did was he started instigating fights by including, inciting some of the old rivalries between the Aus and Khazraj. And another thing that he did for which he was notorious was he used to harass Muslim women in Madina. He made it in such a way that he spread this fear that the streets of Madina are not safe for women. And then he spread slander of the Prophet ﷺ and many of the Sahaba. When the Prophet ﷺ came to know of this, he gathered some individuals from the type, uh, tribes of Aus and told them, look, Kaab ibn Ashraf is trying to create all this unrest in the streets of Madina. We need to handle this problem. Now, Muhammad bin Maslama, one of the Ansar from the Aus tribe, he said, Ya Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let me handle this. 
Is it all right if I do what I have to do? This is the permission he asked from the Prophet The reply was, you do what you have to do. Now, what this uh, Muhammad bin Maslama did, he recruited an Ansari by name of Abu Naila. Now, this Abu Naila was a milk brother of Kab ibn al-Ashraf. So what did, what did Kaab do? He had built a huge fortress around himself on the property that he had inherited so that he could be safe inside the fortress. Can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, you will see the uh, ruins of the fortress. You have the, on top, you have the northern side of the fortress and at the bottom, you have the entrance to the fortress. Look at the type of construction that was made. It's a ruin now, but can you imagine how it was in those days? Can we have the next slide, please? Now, Muhammad ibn Maslama, he starts his expedition. He got some friends from the Ansar and he headed towards this Kab ibn al-Ashraf's house. The next slide, please. Yeah. Now, he made it in such a, a nice manner that he involved Abu Naila, the milk brother of Abu Ka, Abu Ka, of Kab ibn al-Ashraf. And what happened was, this Abu Naila made the introduction to Kab. He said, I wanted to come and visit you and introduce you to one of my friends who was wanting to meet you. So Kaab said, absolutely, come on, you're most welcome. So Mohammed bin Mas Maslama, he tells him, look, we have a bit of problem. This man, the Prophet Wasallam, has come to our community and we followed him. We want to stick it out with him. We agree with him and also we believe in him. But at the same time, we are dealing with a lot of difficulties. Uh, we have poverty at our doorstep. We are finding it very difficult to manage. So he continues and says, I was wondering if you could assist and help me. I want to borrow some money from you. I will pay you back naturally. And this act of yours is definitely going to earn you a lot of influence within my community itself. So Kaab agreed. But as usual, he asked for security deposit. It's known as rahan. Something valuable has to be given as a deposit in place of the loan that is taken. So Muhammad bin Maslama asked, what is it that you would like to have as security? Now look at his reply. Kaab says, why don't you bring your wife and drop her off at my place? I'll hold your wife as my security deposit. Now, Muhammad bin Maslama had to pay, play it cool. He had to handle the situation in the best manner, knowing that he is dealing with one of the most wretched human beings. He told Kaab, how can I leave my wife here with you? She's not going to want to come back home with me once she is with you. Look at the way he replies. Then Kaab says, then why don't you leave your children with me as a security deposit? Like as if the Kaab, uh, this man's children are domesticated animals? Look at how he views it. So here the reply came, come on, brother. People will curse them and tell them, your father left you with somebody as a security deposit. That's what you are worth. That's how much your daddy loves you. I can't do that for my kids. Then Kaab says, okay, okay, I understand. Now, what is it that you can leave as a security deposit? Or do you, your people don't have anything else? Now, the security deposit, that's the Rahan, offered by Maslama, uh, Muhammad bin Ibn Maslama, for the loan that he requested. What did he say? I was hoping the conversation would get here. This was my plan. We don't own anything, but we are only farmers and we 
look after the date palms, but we have some swords, we have some shields and some armor. How will it be if I leave these weapons with you as Rahan? Kaab said, okay, you might as well do that. This is okay with me. So the reply is fantastic. We'll come by tomorrow. Uh, he says, we'll come by tomorrow and we will bring the weapons as a security deposit. So I just imagine Kaab is in a fortress. There are security guards at the entrance of the fortress. Nobody can take anything inside the fortress unless the security guards know about it. So naturally, no weapons can enter inside. So that way, Kaab is very safe. So Muhammad ibn Maslama figured out a way by how he could take these weapons inside. It was very clever of him. So his, he and his group come by the next following night. And that night was a full moon. Abu Naila made it known earlier that he would be visiting Kaab. So when Kaab got out of bed, his wife grabbed him and said, where are you going? Don't go. You are a man who has declared war, so you are not safe. When you are at war, you better be careful. You don't go outside of your house at this hour in the night. Yes, he had declared war. He single-handedly instigated an entire battle. Can you imagine? He single-handedly wanted to keep a war, a war alive. So Kab replied to his wife, this is my foster brother, Abu Naila. If I was sleeping also, this man would never ever wake me up. He's a very gentle person. He would not even hurt a fly. He got up, got dressed, and he went outside. Now the Ansar brought the weapons and said, here are the, here is everything as a security deposit. Then Muhammad ibn Maslama, he suggested to Kaab, such a nice night, full moon is there. Why don't we go for a little walk? It's so very bright and nice. There's some things I would like to talk with you. So Kaab agreed. And the group of Ansari behind him, they started walking around the fortress. Now, another thing was, Kaab had long flowing hair. And the hair would smell really nice because he was applying a certain perfume for his hair. As they were walking, Abu Naila said, man, your hair smells amazing. What do you put for your hair? Do you mind if I smell your hair? Just observe this. So what did Kaab do? He put his head down towards Abu Naila. Abu Naila grabbed Kaab's head and said to Muhammad ibn Maslama, come on, go for it, kill him. Two or three men up from the Ansar got out their swords and they all moved forward at the same time. And they moved in such a way that their swords started hitting each other. Why? These people were not trained. They did not even know how to go about it. They were not skilled assassins. So the answer, they started fumbling with their swords in an attempt to kill Kaab. Now in this incident, when the opportunity came, they all took out their swords, but they started fumbling with them. And the swords started clanging with each other. Abu Naila was holding the head of Kaab and looking baffled. He said, hey, what are you guys doing? Come on, go ahead. One of them, Al-Harith ibn Aus, he actually ended up stabbing another Ansari and hurting his leg by accident. Finally, in some way, Muhammad ibn Maslama, he regained control of the situation and plunged his sword into Kaab and killed him the entire ordeal was ended. Now, why am I going into all this thing? Because this particular incident was taken and, as you know, talked about by the Orientalists, the extremists, and also the Islamophobes. 
how did they portray this incident? Now, this story of Kaab ibn al Ashraf, whatever had happened, is twisted by two opposite extremes. One is the Sahaba were not trained, they were not skilled assassins. This itself bears mentioning because both the extremists, the Orientalists, and the Islamophobes made a portrayal that the Sahaba, based on that particular incident, were Muslims who were cold, who were hard assassins. They portrayed the Sahaba as mysterious, super skilled assassins that would go to any extent. They would hide in the shadows, take you out, and kill and retreat back into the shadows. Are, who were the Sahaba, the Ansar? They were farmers. They were family men. They had wives and children. They had elderly parents. And they had their responsibilities. And every time you see them, you will see them in Ibadah. That's who the Sahaba were. So they weren't skilled assassins. Neither were they trained in any way. Now, some of the Khazraj and uh, Kharij and Khawarij, the extreme Muslim militants who say, the second anybody says anything we don't like, done. Take them out. Look at this extreme. This happened, so anybody talks anything, let us just kill them. This fellow Kaab was a poet. He said something disrespectful to the Prophet, وسلم, so take him out. Now look at the attitude. Look at the approach that people make. And look at the approach that sometimes we ourselves keep making. Similarly, Kaab story is twisted by the Islamophobes and the Orientalists who try to falsely portray, uh, portray and slander the slander Islam. They use the same story and extract rhetoric that, look, the second uh, somebody says something that the Prophet ﷺ did not like, the Muslims would get rid of them. But look at the situation here. Kaab ibn al-Ashraf had declared war. And he single-handedly raised an army in Makkah to attack the Muslims. And not only that, he comes to Medina and starts instigating there. And all his actions ultimately resulted in the Battle of Uhud. So when you read the seerah of Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Kathir, Al-Waqidi, etc., and the earlier sources of the Sira, the answers to all these questions are there. What we need to do is, don't just go by hearsay, go to the source itself. That will give you better information. This group of Ansar made it back to the Prophet ﷺ while they were carrying the wounded Ansari. The Prophet ﷺ saw them covered in blood with one of them bleeding at the leg. He asked, is everything okay? The Ansar replied, everything is all right, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The deed has done. The deed has been done. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua and applied saliva to the wound of the Ansar. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, this is the map of the expedition of Muhammad Ibn Maslamah and the killing of Kaab Ben Al Ashraf. Now, last week we had spoken about the uh, Banu Khaynukha. Uh, if you look into the slide there, there's an arrow pointing, blue arrow, that shows the place where Banu Khaynukha was staying, just for your information. So, Muhammad ibn Maslama, he travels all the way from there towards the fortress of Kaab. It did accomplish the purpose in the sense that anyone else who was trying to start any war kept quiet now. Because they knew that these Muslims will take whatever measures they have in order to protect the sanctity of their homes and their community. It was a defense and not an offense. But even in spite of his death, it did not prevent the Battle of Uhud. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, 
let us look into the factors that led to the battle of Orhud. Why are they fighting? Now we have about four reasons in this. One of them is a religious reason because the Quraysh developed a religious animosity to the Prophet and Islam. What is the social reason factor? Revenge for their lost relatives. Their leaders were lost. They were killed. The leaders were killed. What is the economic effect? The Meccan economy was based upon the pipeline between Syria and Yemen. The Quraysh were in charge of it and they profited it from they profited from it. And Medina geographically intersects the caravans that goes from Namaka to Syria. And what the Muslims used to do, they used to intercept these caravans and they blocked off all the routes to Syria. Even their attempts to find an alternate route was unsuccessful. So economically also they were being affected. Politically, the Prophet ﷺ was now becoming a political threat to them. And the size of the Islamic Republic, the size of the Muslims was growing and many tribes were giving their allegiance to Islam. So this was also an effect. On the 7th of Shawwal, in the third year of Hijra, literally about a year and few weeks after the Battle of Badr, the Quraysh set out from Makkah to Medina. The news of this reaches the Prophet ﷺ. Immediately after the Quraysh army leaves, Al-Abbas, Anhu, he sent a trusted servant to the Prophet ﷺ along with the letter, which gave all the details of the army. The army size, how many horses, how many arms, etc. All the details were given. So this servant rushed to Medina, found the Prophet ﷺ in Khuba, and the Prophet ﷺ asked Ubay ibn Kab to read the letter. And after knowing the contents, he tells this messenger, do not tell anybody of this news. And he immediately rushed back to Medina and sent spies to check on the Quraysh. Now, did the Prophet ﷺ, Naudu Billah, doubt Al-Abbas? Of course not. He trusts his uncle. But then he was thinking, what if the Quraysh had have duped Abbas? So the Prophet ﷺ has to confirm the news before speaking to others about the threat that is coming. So the spies reported that they actually saw the army of 3,000 men close by about a day or two journey from Medina. Now everything falls into place. Again, this shows us the meticulous care of the Prophet. He was acting very cautiously. The Prophet himself, the Prophet himself told us in many ahadis, Acting in predetermined thought is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Acting in haste is from the shaitan. We should learn from this. The situation is critical, but he did not panic. Now, how did the Prophet ﷺ break the news to the Muslims? First, he consulted the leaders of the Ansar to get their counsel. Then the Prophet ﷺ called a general gathering. Look, for a responsible and thoughtful leader, if some big news comes, he first tells the core group. Then he widens the circle, whereas what would a sensationalist do? He would never go to the core group. He'll start spreading the news everywhere and spill the beans there itself. So it happened to be a Friday. The Prophet ﷺ, since everybody was assembled there, he told them everything and then he asked their opinion. What do you think we should do? Can we have the next slide, please? Now, the Prophet ﷺ also said, Allah has showed me a, something in a dream. I saw a cow or an ox or a bull being sacrificed. 
I saw the tip of my sword was broken. Then I put my hand inside my armor to protect myself. Now, according to scholars, the interpretation of the dream is as follows. The animal being sacrificed and blood flowing signified loss of life, which means some Muslims will die. And this is the decree of Allah. The broken sword in the dream has a lot of different meanings from different scholars. They say it could mean that there will be a difficulty in the battle, but some scholars mention that it also means that the Prophet ﷺ himself would be injured in the battle. The Prophet ﷺ referred to Habza, Hamza uh, ibn Abdul Muttalib as Asiyaful Muslimin, Asiyaful Muslimin, the sword of the Muslims, a strength of the Muslims. Hamza was the sharp end of a sword of the army of the Muslims. This was how the dream was interpreted. The Prophet's dream of a broken sword tip foretold that the Muslims will lose someone of, who is a very key person from the Ummah. And that was the death of Hamza Rajalwa Khalid ibn Walid played a key role in the turning of events on the day of Uhud. And he was given the title of Saifullah, the sword of Allah. The sword, the broken sword tip was alluding to the fact that the sword will actually fight against the Muslims, that the sword will be pointed towards the Muslims. I'm not very clear on this, but this I have taken from the opinion of the scholars. The overall theme of the dream was the loss of life the loss could also mean loss of Muslims' positions in the battlefield. The Prophet ﷺ also dreamt of putting his hand inside his armor, representative of the city of Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ putting his hand inside the armor could mean we must stay in Medina. It is the best chance of protecting ourselves. After the Prophet ﷺ updated the Muslims of the situation, naturally there were some discussions amongst the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ's initial position was that the Muslims should stay in Medina and fight from there. He gives his opinion first and he says, I see myself in a protected fortress. That is, he's saying, I think we should stay in Medina. Now, what would be the advantage to have the war in Medina? As we mentioned, Medina was a very unique city. It had a lot of natural protection. If you see on the east and west, there were a volcanic lock. The two Harra, they say, Al Harra Al Sharfiya and Harra Al Gharabiya. No one could walk on them. On the north is the large mountain of Ohad. Towards Huba in the south, there are po pockets of date palms. Of course, an army cannot walk through a plantation of date palms. If the army would have attacked, it would have resulted in the street-to-street uh, street -street fighting. So the Muslims could have easily tackled them and won also. They could set up barricades and traps, etc. within Medina. Now, amazingly, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul agreed. Not because he appreciated the Prophet ﷺ, because it was the correct opinion. And we know that he was a very seasoned warrior amongst them. Now, let us look at what was the majority opinion. A group of younger companions who were eager to fight in the battle, what they said was, why should we remain in our houses like cowards? Rather, we should go out like brave men and fight them in the battlefield. And these were the same young men who had regretted not participating in the Battle of Badr. They continued pressurizing the Prophet ﷺ to go out. While they were saying this, the senior Sahaba kept quiet. Finally, when the Prophet ﷺ felt that the majority were saying that he should go out, he agreed to it and he went inside 
to put on his armor. As soon as he went inside, when he was not there in the presence of the other people, the elder Sahaba opened up and they began reproaching the younger Sahaba. They said the Prophet ﷺ told us his opinion at the beginning and yet you persisted in suggesting the opposite until he agreed to your opinion. How could you have done this? Why did you do this? Immediately the younger Sahaba felt very embarrassed at what had transpired. So what they did was, they sent Hamza anhu to the Prophet Sallallahu house to tell him, we have changed our minds. But when Hamza anhu entered there, the Prophet Sallallahu had already put on his armor. He had fastened the straps. So he said, it is not possible, it is not befitting once a prophet has worn his armor that, that he takes it off until he fights the enemy. Uh, this you will find as, uh, in Musnad Imam Ahmad. The Prophet says, it's too late to change the mind. Then Hamza who says, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't worry about it. I swear by the one who has sent the Quran to you that we will fight the Quraysh. We will meet them in the battlefield. So once everyone gathered together, they started to set out towards the place of Ohad with an army of about 1,000 people. Now, let us look at the lessons, the points of benefit that we have from this incident. Subhanallah, you'll find many benefits. The status of shura in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Though he felt confident staying in Madina, he knows, like any other good leader knows, that you need the people behind you. You cannot just impose your will onto them. The way of dealing in this is to have shura, counseling. Therefore, when the majority of companions, according to the Prophet Sallallahu interpretation is, they wanted to fight outside Madina, he gives to the demand and he puts on his armor. Next, notice the wisdom of the older Sahaba. First, they accept the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Second, they did not argue with the young Sahaba in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu the height of other, the etiquettes here is amazing. They could have told the younger companions then and there, can you keep quiet, please? Shut up. We've already made up our minds. The Prophet ﷺ has made up his mind. Isn't it rude to have the, it'll be rude for you to talk against the Prophet ﷺ. They could have said all this. But then look again. Isn't it rude to have this bickering in front of the leader, in front of the Prophet ﷺ? What effect would it have had? They could have had this harshness, but out of respect to the Prophet ﷺ, they kept their mouth shut until the Prophet ﷺ got out of earshot. And we also know that young men in particular are always overzealous and many times rash. A little bit of arrogance and cockiness is there. Generally speaking, it's in their nature. This is what makes up the young men. And this could work both ways. It could be overzealousness within the religions. It could also be against the religion. It could be exaggeration, which is not in the spirit of religion, but everything has a good intention. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ said he cannot take his armor off shows that there is a special sharia for the prophets. We know from this and other ayat and hadith as well, they have a code by which they operate, the prophets. We know of many such aspects that the Prophet ﷺ was able to do, which we are not able to do. In many instances, when the Prophet ﷺ did something and the Sahaba also wanted to do it, he would say, no, 
I am not like one of you. It is for me to do it. It is not necessary. It is not obligatory for you to do it. So he forbade the Sahaba from doing certain things which he did. If you look into the Sharia, if you look more into the Prophet Sallallahu life, his guidance to the Muslims, you will find incidents where he does it, but at the same time he tells his followers they need not do it. So here it's not fitting for the prophets that once they have worn their armor, once they have decided to take a step, that they will take it off before they fight their enemies. Perhaps one of the most amazing things about the whole incident is that once the decision is made, the younger Sahaba were not criticized. They were not criticized. They were not blamed. Nobody came back to them and say, said, see, I told you so. Look now, are you happy that these things have happened? Nobody said it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 159, and by the mercy of Allah, you dealt with them gently. And had you been severe and harsh-hearted, they would have broken away from you. So pass over their faults and ask Allah's forgiveness for them and consult them in the affairs. Then, when you have taken a decision, put your trust in Allah. Certainly, Allah loves those who put their trust in Him. And our Prophet ﷺ has said, none of you should say, what if? What if I did this, such and such would have done happened. If I did that, that would have happened. Don't ever use the word if, don't ever use the word but. Rather, say, whatever Allah has willed has occurred. Because by saying what if and but etc. opens up the door to the shaitan. That is, you start doubting and the shaitan starts doing vaswasa from towards us. Therefore, once you make up your mind properly, no one should blame anybody else for the decision taken. Now, what does it mean to make up your mind properly? The first, of course, is pray istikhara. Don't just follow what others people guide you to pray. Do it like this. You do it in the night. Do it in the morning. You wait for some ishara. No. There are so many authentic sources on how to perform istikhara. Why don't you go to those sources and follow them instead of just asking around and following other people unless you know they have the correct details. Next is after istikhara, you get istishara. That is counseling. They seek advice from the people. Anytime you have any major decisions to make, you do these two things. Do your istikhara and seek advice. And supposing the outcome turns to be a disaster, tell yourself you did what you thought is best. Put your trust in Allah. Tawakkal al Allah. And also be assured that he has something better planned for you which you cannot see at the moment. This is exactly what happened in the Battle of Ohad. Can we have the next slide, please? Ibn Ishaq says the Prophet ﷺ wore two suits of armor. Despite the fact, of course, Allah has promised to protect the Prophet ﷺ, but you don't act so foolishly and say, Tawakkal Allah, Allah is going to protect me, so I may as well go, I need, I may not wear, I need not wear any armor. No, no, no. You have to do everything possible. And if it means arming yourself to the hilt before you go to battle, do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran regarding the battle, Surah An-Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayah number 71, the interpretation reads, O oh, you who believe, take your precautions and either go forth in the expeditions in parties or go forth together. Go in groups or go together. So whatever you are doing, make sure you do it with Allah in your mind. 
And also you have to take all the physical means that are necessary. Now, what were the uh, preparations by the Muslims for the Battle of Uhud? The Prophet ﷺ divided the Muslims into three groups. The Muhajirun under the leadership of Musab ibn Umair, the Aus under Usaid ibn Hudair, and the Khazraj under Al-Hubab ibn Al-Mundir. Because the situation was very dire, they only had a handful of horses and about a hundred suits of armor. After the Istishara, the Muslims made their way to the mountain of Had on later Friday afternoon. Now, let us look into the blessings of the mountain of Ohad. The next slide, please. This mountain of Ohad, Jabal Ohad, Jabal Ohad, is not just one mountain. If you will see, it's a whole series of mountains of Madina. They are about nearly a little less than two kilometers long. And there are many ahadis about this mountain Uhud. The Prophet ﷺ said, Uhud is a mountain of Jannah. Some scholars say this means Uhud is a beloved mountain. Others say Uhud will be transported into Jannah. In one hadith, when the Prophet ﷺ came back from an expedition, the first thing he saw was the Mount of Uhud, and he said, Uhud is a mountain that loves us, and we love it. You'll find this in Bukhari. So it's a sign of Iman, and it's a sign of Iman to love Uhud. It's uh, narrated in Sahih Muslim that once the Prophet ﷺ was climbing Uhud with Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman Razilatala and Hum, and the mountain began to tremble. The Prophet ﷺ tapped it with his foot and he said, Calm down, Uhud, for really there's only one Nabi, a Siddiq, and two Shaheeds on you. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And another thing is this Mount Uhud is included in the haram. Recall that Madina is called a haram. The boundaries of the haram of Madina, as reported in Bukhari, are between the two mountains, Thaur and Air, that's north and south, two volcanic plains on the east and west. There's a small mountain Thaur towards the north and Ohad. So Ohad is also included inside the haram. Inshallah, in the next slide, in the next session, we will find out why did the Prophet ﷺ choose Ohad? And what are, what are the events that happened subsequently to that? Uh, we'll meet, meet to the duas. I have changed the duas this time, inshallah. Allahumma zayyanna bizinatil iman wajalna hudatam muhtadeen. It's so beautiful. O oh Allah, beautify, decorate us with the beauty of Allah and make us guides who are guided. Before we guide anybody, we should make sure that we are guided. SubhanAllah. Next Dua, please. Allahumma inna nas'aluka min al-khayri kullihi ajilihi wa ajilihi Ma alim na minhu wa ma alim na alim. This is part of a long zua. We'll continue this one. O oh Allah, verily, we ask you for all good in this life. Good here means the best. And the next life. Ajilihi is now. Ajilihi is later. It could even mean this life and next life. Or it could mean today and tomorrow. Of what we know and what we do not know. Next please. And we seek refuge in you from all evil in this life and the next life of what we know and of what we do not know. Next slide, please. Allahumma inna nas'alukal jannatul firdausi وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ خَوْلٍ وَعَمَلٍ 
ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من قول وعمل It's a beautiful dua. Oh Allah, verily we ask you for Jannatul Firdaus. And whatever will bring us close to that through our statements and our deeds, our actions. Our tongues and our actions. And we seek refuge in you from the hellfire and whatever brings us closer to it of our statements and deeds. Now here there is a very famous hadith. I am sure many of you all know about it. If you make dua continuously in every salah or every uh, time you get, you repeat Allahumma inna nas'alukal jannatul firdausi wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin wa amalin. If you do this three times, the Prophet Sallallahu says, Jannah will come to ask Allah, O oh Allah, this slave of yours is asking for uh, to come into Jannah. Please allow him into Jannah. And then if you say, وَنَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ النَّارِ وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ قَوْلٍ وَعَمَلٍ If you say it three times, the hellfire will say, O oh Allah, this slave of yours does not want to enter us. Please do not allow him to enter into the fire. Now, just imagine it's so simple. If, but if you should do it, you must do it sincerely. If you do it sincerely, inshallah, you will feel the effect within yourself. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts this dua from you, he will make your life very easy. He will give you the guidance. He will lead you to ways which will take you to Jannatul Firdaus, inshallah. May Allah put us into the habit of reciting this dua as many times as possible. And if you recite this during sajda, three times during sajda, how beautiful it would be because that's the time when you're closest to Allah. Can we have the next one, please? Yeah, that's all for today. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.